have got our tray open. This is what we did the last time. Y'all come a little closer. So first thing, let's go back over. So what is actually sterile on me right now? So from chest to waist, okay? What about the arms? Which part of the arms? All the way. And then what, there is part of the upper arm, the front. just the front at chest level, okay? Is any of my back? No. no. Good. All right, so on the tray, same thing. We have a sterile area. What's sterile on the tray? You have a 10 inch. One inch. Well, I'm sorry, one inch. That's mm -hmm. okay. About a one inch area around the edge. Everything hanging over. And everything hanging over. Perfect. So anything on the top um, within that kind of that framed out one inch section is considered sterile. Okay, so remember we talked about that there's going to be some labs that have more items that's already on the tray. Um, some are going to have very minimal. Um, this one actually came with the drape and the towels already on it, okay? Um, these were extra items that we passed. You're always going to be passing a wire and a sheath, and we're going to go into more detail about all of this as we go. Um, and this is a cleaning prep stick to clean the access site. This is that one I showed you the picture of, the chlor prep with the chlorhexidine soap in it, okay? And we're gonna get into more detail about actually cleaning the site and all that later on. Okay, one of the things that um, I like for you all to understand is that I'm gonna show you one way to set this tray up. There are multiple ways. And when you get out into, if you go calf and you get out into your rotations, you're gonna see multiple ways. Your preceptor may have a different way than I set it up, okay? They'll teach you that way. They're gonna want you to do that way. Here, you're gonna learn my way. There may be some differences. You're gonna have to adapt, okay? They're, they have a reason that they set up their tray the way that they do. I have a reason that I set up the tray the way I do. I'm gonna say that I think most technologists try to have the same concept of what I'm gonna give you, why I put certain things on one side as opposed to the other. I think there's kind of a basic understanding on that. Once you become your own scrub tech, you get your job and you can tweak that however you feel comfortable, okay? Maybe you liked a little bit of the way I did things, you liked a little bit of the way your preceptor did things, and so you kind of come up with your own way to do things. There's still a kind of basic concept though you still need to keep. You also want to try to do it the same way every time. Okay, that way repetition means you can almost do it in your sleep. And at 2 a.m. when you get called in for a STEMI, you kind of want to be able to do it in your sleep almost, you know. So um, becoming very, um, doing it the same way, uh, repetition is going to help you to be able to do it quicker also, okay? Like I said, there's certain kind of, I'm going to say, unwritten rules about certain things we place in certain areas. So what I like to do is, and, and I'm on this side of the tray because there's my patient. And I'm going to be draping my patient. That's one of the other things I'm going to be doing and getting everything set up on the patient. And this is going to be my workspace. Okay, so in between the tray and the patient. I'm gonna be working more at the patient once we start the procedure than my tray, but I still have this area. And so this area, once I drape my patient, is all gonna be my sterile field for the most part, okay? Um, so what I like to try to do is, and, and like I said, most people, they're gonna keep all of their wet to one side. Now how be, where be it if it's this side or this side, doesn't really matter, but you don't wanna mix dry and wet because then the dry is gonna get wet a lot easier. So again, I like to keep my more wet stuff kind of to this side, and I like to keep my more dry, things I need to keep or want to keep dry on this side. This center area is going to be my workspace, okay? I also, very important, this I would say is the most, really should be, should be a rule. Any of your sharps, you're gonna keep towards the back of your tray, okay? That way, if it is an exposed sharp, um, 
you have a lot less chance of getting yourself stuck. Okay, so if you come back over to grab something and say you are in a, a, a emergency situation and you need to come back over and grab something, you know, if, if you've got your a needle that's exposed and there is one specifically that, that it's probably going to be um, still exposed, the tip of it, and I'm gonna show you how to protect yourself with that. And it's laying out here because you just threw it over here and you come and you try to grab something, you could stick yourself, okay? So that I think is one of the most important things to try to keep in, in mind. Um, make sure that you do kind of keep your sharps towards the back of the tray and again, kind of all together. At the end of the procedure, you have to get rid of your sharps in a red bin and make sure you account for all of your sharps as well. So keep, keeping them all together will help you at the end of the procedure as well, okay? Now, once we, and I don't have everything, and I didn't even show the last group, the manifold, so I'm not gonna do it this time, but there is another piece that we're gonna have on here, and actually our catheters, but T is gonna help me demonstrate how, how as a circulator, you would be passing off catheters, and then as the scrub tech, you're gonna be receiving the catheters, okay? And we'll do that, that's gonna be a little bit later. But so, I walk up to my tray, I've already passed some of these extra items off, and now I need to start working on setting things up, okay? So this depends on, on how you wanna do it, but what I normally do is just try to start kinda of getting things away from the middle, right? So my towels, I want them to stay dry. So I'm gonna have towels, and I'm gonna let you guys take a picture of this because actually I want a hand-drawn picture of this tray set up in your little book and everything kind of labeled, okay? But you can take a picture to use to work it once I get everything set up, okay? Um, this is just a drape uh, that they use for something, I'm not sure. I am going to keep it dry, I'm just gonna keep it over here. This is a light handle, so most labs have a light that comes down from the ceiling and it can move around, and so that we can touch it and stay sterile and move that light where we want, this goes onto the handle. So that wasn't on your list, but it is maybe another item that'll be on your tray. Tube drapes, okay, so these will um, drape the image intensifier, the shield, we may have a shield that sits right here that kind of hangs, there's a piece that kind of is up high, we might use the tube drape to cover that. I'm gonna demonstrate that a little later, how we're actually going to drape the tube to keep ourselves sterile. We'll get there later. Here's some of our four by fours. I want them to stay dry. Now we are gonna wet some of them as we go, um, but for now, I want that to be in my dry area. This is my drape. Now some of these items are gonna come off of my tray as I use them. But for the initial setup, I kind of want to get everything out and then I'll start working on getting the things prepped as I want to get them prepped and then get, and getting the patient draped and towels on and all that kind of stuff, okay? Now, this is my suggestion. Well, here's some labels. We want to keep those dry. We can kind of sit those over there. Is that instead of trying to sit here and take everything out, you can just dump everything out of your bowls in the center. Now, they are gonna come packed tighter. We've already been through this tray in the last class and we put everything back. When they originally come, they're gonna, it's all gonna be kind of really tight in there. And so um, that kind of slipped out, probably a little messier than maybe it would even um, with a brand new. And I have a couple extra items on here too, just because I wanna show you some differences in some items. Okay, so this is going to be my flush, my heparinized flush. So remember I talked about that pretty lengthy in class, but I really wanted you to understand. And um, Tia is gonna help me also demonstrate about passing off the flush. I'm gonna use my two bowls. So I'm gonna have a waste bowl and I'm gonna have a trash bowl. Now, like I said, this is where some things can differ for people. Some people like their flush um, in a small bowl and they'll use the big bowl for their trash bowl. Whatever they want to do, 
that's fine, okay? Like I said, there's no written rule. I was just always taught the bigger bowl um, for a specific reason. Now, that is one thing that I try to say, and I forgot to tell the last group, but this is where there's a lot of little details, right? So you can ask Tia. I mean, I already told you, cath lab is not that difficult, but there's a, the most difficult part of it is there's so many little details to pay attention to. And this is where a lot of that comes in. So what I say is it seem, might seem like madness that I'm telling you all these little details to try to do. But there's a method, you ever heard that? There's a method to the madness. There's a reason, I have a reason behind everything that I do the way that I do it, okay? Again, not saying that there's not other ways that it can be done, but I can't show you all 10, 20 different ways. I don't have enough time. Plus your mind would go, you know, if I tried to teach you all those different ways. So I'm gonna show you my way. I'm gonna try to give you the method to the madness, why I do it the way I do it. And then, like I said, when you get into the lab, you'll see people doing things just a little bit different. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just their method to the, to the madness, okay? Um, most trays are gonna have a sharps box, hopefully. Um, if they don't, some people will use uh, maybe their trash bowl as their sharps, okay? Whatever it is, again, this is something you just wanna do every single time the same way, okay? Um, so that's our sharps box. Again, we wanna have it to the back. This is a, a little medicine cup. Um, we can use this for putting our lidocaine in it, nitroglycerin, any kind of medication that we might have passed off. We're gonna use this one for lidocaine today. I'm just gonna kinda set it over there. She's gonna have to pour my lidocaine, um, pour my flush. So another thing is, I don't, I don't want my flush bowl sitting here in the middle, plus I need a workspace for doing all the things I need to do to get this tray prepped. I don't wanna have my flush tray here, and then she's not supposed to be reaching over, right? That's one of the things, she's not scrubbed in. She is the circulator, so she's gotta get me my fluid. I want it to be closer to the edge so that I can actually be working and she can come over here and pass fluid off while I'm working, okay? Getting all of this set up. And that's one of the things as a good circulator that you'll get to that point where the scrub tech doesn't have to ask you, okay, I'm, I'm ready for my flush, I'm ready for my lidocaine. You'll come up and say, okay, I'm giving you, and the scrub tech will be, yeah, okay. If you're not sure where they want it, you just ask them. That's one thing with our labels. Remember how I mentioned that everything has to be labeled, okay? So I usually kind of go ahead and start labeling. That way that does help the circulator to know that I've put my heparin flush on this bowl. That's the bowl I'm gonna want my heparin. Now I'm having her wait just because I don't, I want to, focus on what she's doing because you need to know how to pass flush off as well. So we're gonna go through some other stuff and then we'll get to that point. But just kind of going ahead and showing you that I would go ahead and start labeling. And that way my circulator could come on over if they were finished, maybe they were shaving the patient and getting the site prepped for me. Um, but then once she's done, she could come over and start passing. Um, my lidocaine, I'm gonna go ahead and put on my little cup. So that's where I'm gonna want her to put my lidocaine for right now. And then I'll demonstrate the doing the syringes in just a minute, but we need to still go over a few other items that are on the tray. We're not gonna worry about these right now. So I talked to you guys about, and this needle just keeps trying to come out of there. Those there. Some of, I said, um, so syringes. I just kind of was generic on the list, syringes and needles, right? Okay, so it kind of depends, but you're probably at least going to have some 10 or 12 cc syringes, all right? You might have some three cc's, five cc's. You might have a 20. Usually there is at least one that's at least 20 or 30 cc's, okay? really going to use this one when we have to prep the manifold that's what it's 
really you have to have a good kind of a large syringe when you're prepping your manifold system but I still I like to use the larger one just as my flush in case I have to get a, a, a catheter passed off to me and we have to flush it out or whatever um, <clears throat> And again, just depending on um, the physician you're working with, depending on what kind of procedure you may be doing as to how many flush syringes you're gonna have and even if you're even gonna have any three cc's. Okay. These syringes are called lure lock syringes. Okay, so they actually will screw on and I'll just use this as an example for right now. So you put it on, it actually will screw on. That's called a lure lock, okay? This is another type syringe. This is called a slip tip syringe. So that just slips in, but it doesn't secure that well. I'll just tell you that a lot of labs primarily use the lure locks because they, you can secure them on a little bit better than these, especially if we're on needles. Um, I don't like using the slip tip very much, but I did want, just in case you see it, you know what the different, you, and you know the different name. If somebody specifically asks you for a slip tip syringe, then you know what they were talking about, as opposed to the lure lock. And those are the two main kind of syringes that I know of out there. I'm actually gonna put my slip tip over there because we're not gonna use it. These are some, just some clips or clamps that we can use when we actually put the, after we put the drape on the patient. And so right now I, I don't want them, I'm just going to kind of put them in my trash or my extra stuff bowl. If there was any paper, like here we go, maybe this paper that I want to pull off of my four by fours. And I could also put that in there. Or usually there is a trash can close to you. And so any larger items that you might have, if you want to throw into the trash, you can try to toss it into the trash. We miss quite often, right, Tia? <laughs> so, and then the circulator has to pick up after us. Um, but they're like, you'll see whenever I get one of the catheters, I'm gonna demonstrate two ways. That there are some times where there's some bigger bulky pieces, and especially for interventional devices, that you might want to just throw away because it's taking up too much space on your tray. Okay. Um, all right, the needles. So we kind of talked about our syringes. Um, in a minute when I label, I'll talk more about what we're gonna put in them and, and how we're gonna fill them and some of that kind of stuff. But right now, I'm just trying to, again, go over the things that are on the tray. Um, needles, so. Usually you're going to have um, at least two needles to administer a lidocaine to the patient. So the lidocaine is the numbing medicine, all right? And usually you're going to have, and I'm just gonna put it on the syringe because it's easier. You're gonna have a short, this is about a 22 gauge needle, okay? This we would use to numb up radial, numb up superficial femoral, okay? I'm gonna talk to you more about what I just did in just a second. Right now, I just wanna show you the needles. This is a little bit longer one. This is still a 22 gauge. This actually says what it is on it. It's a 22 and it's a one and a half length, okay? This we would use to numb up deeper into the femoral. So your femoral artery lies a good bit deeper under the tissue than your radial. We're not gonna need this here. Your radial is very superficial. So it's very close to the surface. So usually we're never gonna use this long needle to numb up here. So this is one of the things as we're setting up, if I know that this is a radial, I wouldn't even use this needle. I wouldn't even pull it out. I would have it on my tray because it's a generic tray, okay? I would just kind of set this to the side back here, okay? I wanna show you these other, so those were needles that are not safety. So they, they have these needles, they're the same length and everything, but these are safety needles. 
So you actually, once you're finished using them, you just flip up that little cap and it covers the tip of it. Yeah. And once you've used this kind of needle, you can't use it again. So if you needed another one, for whatever reason, sometimes maybe, the physician tried to go right for moral, numbed it up, closed it, we put it back here, now they can't get access. So now they're saying, oh, we need to try left femoral. Get me some more lidocaine and needles. And so they do have these separate that you can pass off onto the tray. And so that's your best practice is to try and get new needles. There is a way to undo these, but um, it's not safe. You can stick yourself. So for practicing purposes here, I do it but I'm not teaching you how to do that. But I did want you to understand, um, just you wanna get new needles if you have to get more lidocaine and you have to administer again. Um, some doctors you're gonna see won't flip the safety up because they're not sure, especially on the longer one, because they're not sure if the, it's gonna be enough lidocaine, the whole 10 cc syringe. Okay, so they'll actually leave it unsafetyed, and then if when they start sticking the patient, the patient say, ow, ow, I still, you know, and they feel like they need more lidocaine administration, then we don't have to worry about getting a whole new needle. So these are, again, these are so, just so many different little scenarios that can happen. Okay, anyway, go back to just the basics of the tray. I'm gonna go over that in a minute. So these are just needles, safety needles, same kind of needle. You may have a needle uh, a little bit larger, like a, this one is my 18 gauge. So that's a thicker needle. This we really use to draw up medications maybe. So from the circulator, all right? We don't do that that often. Did you guys do any drawing up or? They poured it. They poured it. Yeah, most people these days are gonna use the pop in the top of the medication and just pouring it. That way we do save not having to use a needle. Um, it does kind of save things. Now I want you to just, do, cause I've done it now twice. So technically we're, we're not supposed to recap needles, right? We learned that back in 1000, we talked about that. Um, there are ways safely though that we can recap a needle. My suggestion though is if that needle has ever been in a patient, you don't recap the needle. I don't care if there is safety, you're gonna see people who do it. But for best practice, it is best to just, if this had been used in a patient, then I would bring it and just put it in my sharps box. And this is styrofoam, okay? And so you just stick it down in there and it makes that, um, where the, the sharp part is not accessible, so to speak. Okay, yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Since this is sterile and there's a blood on that needle, is it okay to put it on this? Yes, because this is the patient's. patient's. Got it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now the patient's blood is part of this procedure, is part of this tray. It, it, their blood is considered sterile to them. To them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, no one else is. Mm -hmm. If I got stuck, and my blood got on this tray, it's contaminated. Mm -hmm. But if their blood gets on this tray, this is their tray, this is their, this is their body, so yes. Mm -hmm. But good, good thought. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that, but I like that, good, good thought. Um, okay, but if you, say you did just use this, and I'm gonna put it on here, to draw up medication and you thought, well, I might need it again, and you didn't want to stick it down in there, you could, okay? But if we did recap it, the safe way to recap is to have the lid on the table and go in, and then secure by just pushing it on. Now that's very, this is one of those very fine, small little details to think about. One of the things you don't wanna do is come from here and push down. I've had one of these actually come through the side and poke me. 
So you always want to think about when you're dealing with any kind of shark to have your fingers as far away in certain situations as possible. So when we're recapping, we want to come down here because the tip is up here. I'm far away from the tip, so if it did poke through the side, it's not going to poke me and secure the cap back on. Now when I'm going to remove, it's the opposite though. Because if I remove down here, look how close I could be to poking myself, all right? I sneeze all of a sudden or something as I'm pulling it off and I could possibly poke myself. But watch the difference if when I'm removing, I come to the tip, look how much farther my hand is away from that sharp tip, okay? So just little teeny details to try to think about. All right, so that was demonstrating that. Now let's go back to some of the items. So needles, some of the needles, syringes. Here's our blade. Okay, so this is the number 11 blade. This is a safety. So you push that blade out. Number 11 blade is a very sharp, pointy blade. Right, we use this blade to make a little nick in the skin when we get our access. We don't ever make a large enough cut in the skin that we're gonna need stitches or anything, but when I demonstrate how we actually get access, you'll understand that I think a little bit better um, about what I'm saying, the nick in the skin. There, is, there are other blades. The only other blade that I've ever used is called a number 15 blade. And that blade is a round, more rounded blade. And that is for making more larger incisions. And I'll draw a picture. Um, I forgot to do that. Remind me if you can help me remember to draw a picture of the um, number 15 blade. Um, when you're done, you retract it. It's like an X-Acto knife almost. You know, if anybody ever used one of those. Um, and so that's our number 11 blade. This is just another example. Uh, this is one that's not a safety. It's exactly the same shape. It's a different color, you know, and again, just depending on the lab as to what kind of a blade they have on their tray. All right, if I'm done with that, and I had in a patient, I'm just gonna stick it in there to protect myself and have the sharp part for the most part covered. If I was going to recap it, same way as with a needle, down low to secure, up high to remove. Okay, so that's our number 11. Just two different ones, it's the same thing. Okay, this is our access needle or percutaneous needle. So this is what we actually, and this is why we numb the skin up because this is an 18 gauge, pretty large bore needle. And this is what we use specifically this length and this size for femoral access. Okay, so to be able to hit the artery or hit the vein for whichever procedure we're doing. Right now we've learned that the artery is, when we hit the artery and we go in the artery, what do we call that procedure? We just learned that Tuesday. Percutaneous. It is a percutaneous, but what do we specifically call it when we're accessing the artery? The scene? You wanna help them? Is it retrograde? Is that what you're asking? Nope. What, what do we call that, like it's a generic name for the procedure that we're gonna do on this patient? Patient comes in the room, they say, okay, we're gonna do this kind of procedure. Um, diagnostic. It is a diagnostic, but more. So what side of the heart is the artery? Mm -hmm. The left or the left. right? Left. So the left heart cath. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking way too much. Yeah, right? <laughs> so left left, left okay. heart cat. I do remember saying, I mean, oh, saying oh, yeah. 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 We were just like left heart <laughs> cat. Mm -hmm. That's what we I started lecturing on yeah. mm -hmm. on Tuesday. Your left heart catheterization. We hit the artery, we access the artery with this needle. 
We haven't got to a right heart cath yet, but the right heart cath is when we access the vein. And then a combined, we do both. Of course, artery, artery or vein first and then the other one. Not at the exact same time, but okay. But that's our needle. Um, when we do radials, we do have some smaller needles. Would you grab that radial sheath we had there right here? This one. This one actually has um, just in. You want to see this? Yes. Just pass it off like you pass it off sterilely. We'll pretend. So this is just <clears throat> a little bit shorter and not quite as thick of a gauge. This is just one example that they might use for a radial access needle. Okay. <clears throat> and we're going to get into way more detail, obviously, about all exactly how they get access exactly what you're gonna need to do to assist the doctor to get access, to set everything up. Right now, we're just talking about the pieces. I am gonna show you how to prep everything and get it ready at this stage. And then the next part will be when we drape the patient and we set it up over here for the doctor. So remember, we are the doctor's assistant. The doctor wants to come in and have everything ready for him to be able to do the procedure. And then we're gonna clean everything up after the procedure is done. Okay, and we're gonna assist during the procedure as well, okay? All right, so those are our access needles. Uh, this is, did I show, I already show you the prep stick? Yeah, okay, yeah, like was, we looked at that. Labels, okay, the, this is a sheath, All right? So sheaths come in different sizes. We're gonna get into more detail about this later. Um, the French, they're called French sizes. My vascular people, you already know what a French size is, but those of you who aren't, that is instead of using diameter or gauge, so for needles they call it, the size of it is a gauge. For sheaths and catheters, they call it a French size. Probably the doctor, somebody who can't, I don't know why they call it a French size to tell you the truth, but that's what it's called. It is still diameters, and so every one French equals 0.33 diameters. And you're gonna, my vascular people, don't worry, we're gonna, you're actually gonna learn that again and be tested on it and that'll sink in. So right now, don't worry if it's not sinking in. Um, that, and that's the outside diameter. Diagnostic procedure. So this is a six French sheath. Um, they go up, so they start at four French, usually our smallest. And they go as high as 24 French, okay? So there's actually, that was an 11 French in there, which they have that packaged where the dilator is, that's just a packaging thing that they do. So it may come to you like this, right? That's not the way it needs to go. It can't go in the patient like this. So that's just a packaging thing. Show them the other way. So in that plastic piece, it may come separate, separate like that is, okay? There's actually a little wire in there and that access needle was in there. And that's like the whole kit for a radial sheath access. There's multiple ones of those. Give me a little bit different, okay? Um, when you get it, if it is like this, of course you're gonna pull it apart the two pieces, and we're gonna go over this again. This is all in your lecture notes. So if you, I know I'm saying a lot very fast right now, but I just don't wanna say, okay, this is this thing right now and this is what you do with it. You know, <laughs> I'm going to explain it um, a little, we, but we will get into it a little deeper as well. Um, so we kind of call the whole thing the sheath, they, they call it the sheath assembly. Most people just call it all the sheath when you put it together, but this does have a specific name. This is the dilator, okay? And so once you put it together, if you'll notice, see how blunt the end of that sheath is? It's kind of flat. To try to push that through skin and push that through an artery, it would be kind of, it would be difficult. You couldn't do it. So what this dilator does is it helps to transition. So it's tapered at the end, kind of a little sharper. And so it, and it's small, a little smaller at the end. 
and it helps you as you're trying to get it into the tissue that it goes in smoother. Once you get it in, you're gonna remove that dilator and then you have this um, sheath that holds the spot in the artery or the vein and then you can put your catheters in and out, your wires and your catheters in and out. So every bit just like this, that's what's hanging outside of the body. This is what's inside of the body, in the artery or the vein. And is the doctor actually poking the patient or we do? So most places it's the doctor uh -huh. that does that. We have, as I said, everything set up set for up. the physician and we assist. We take away the sharps once they're done with the sharps. We get them put back here. We have the sheath prepped and ready. We may have to hold on to the wire because when we put the sheath in, we actually put the wire in first. So, and we'll get into that later. That's a whole nother, whole nother lecture, whole nother class time, um, but we will get there, okay? Um, I'm gonna teach you how to prep that and actually, because just putting it together the way I did, that's not the prep. So we'll prep that in a minute. This is a wire. Um, these come in a hoop, or some people call it the rack. Um, and when you take it out, it is pretty flimsy. I do try to keep them in the hoop as much as I can. Um, once we start using it though, then we have to take it out. We have to be able to learn how to wrap them and secure them properly. But you'll learn all of that. Um, but for now, and, and there are multiple different kinds of wires that we're gonna go into. Um, but right now, just understand that these are some of those basic items that you're gonna have on every diagnostic tray and even interventional trays. This is a pretty basic setup. I'm just gonna load it back in for right now. All right, Tia, am I missing anything? You know that I say this four different times, and can you think of anything that, oh, hemostats. Anything I didn't tell them about on the tray right now? All right, so the hemostats. This was something that I did not put on your list, but most every tray is gonna have a pair of hemostats. Um, we're gonna use them for different purposes, removing the needle, the doctor might actually put it down into the tissue tract to kind of open up the tissue tract before they try to put the sheath in, just to kind of almost like make a little tunnel area there once they make the little nick in the skin. They may put it here um, on the patient because you can't see the artery under fluoro to try, and we're, you're gonna learn more about that, to make sure they're at the access that they wanna be at. Uh, different reasons we might use a pair of hemostats. You do need to kind of play with them. At first, they're awkward because they do clamp together um, and to get them open to be able to use them because they snap, you kind of have to get used to um, using them. And once you start playing with it, I'll try to help you give you, try those that don't just automatically, because you don't just pull. See how I'm, you, if you just pull, they're, they're locked. You actually have to kind of push with this finger out and kind of pull back with this finger to get that to unlock. So you'll just have to kind of play with that. I hate those. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a marker. This is just if, not every tray is gonna have the marker on it, but say, for some reason, you don't already have a pre-labeled um, label and they give you some different kind of medication or something, um, you could write what it is. So that's where we're gonna go next. So labeling, I already labeled my flush bowl. I talked to you guys about it in class. Every fluid has got to be labeled. Any container, any syringe that's holding fluid has to be labeled because I can put lidocaine in this syringe and I can put flush in this syringe, how do I know which one is which? Mm -hmm. They're both clear, mm -hmm. okay? So we used to have ways before labels, cause yeah, there was a time we didn't label them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there really was. Um, and we would put certain syringes or we would do certain things so that we knew. Mm -hmm. But things still happened. And so that is actually a Jayco rule 
So the accrediting body that comes in and says, oh, you guys are doing things right or you're not doing things right and we're gonna pull your, your accreditation and now you're not gonna get paid. Um, and that's a big deal, you know? So that is one of their big standards for us is that we have to label. That way we don't accidentally give the patient the wrong uh, medication or any, anything wrong, okay? So I've already labeled this. I've already labeled my lidocaine. Now I'm gonna decide what syringes I want to have flush in. I always use my larger syringe as a flush syringe. And I'm gonna have three, I think I'm missing a 10 there, that's a slip tip. Can you find me? I should have some over there, Tia. Some 10, mm -hmm. So you said that little cup is used for a different medication? Mm -hmm. So like, if you have it for lidocaine and then you want nitroglycerin, do they pass off another cup? So there's some tricks. And a lot of times you'll have two of these cups. This oh, tray, okay. um, I just opened up, well, she just passed it off sterilely. So um, this tray, the, most of these items that were on this tray was one I had pulled out of the room. Um, and so it only came with one medicine cup, but like those two trays, they have two medicine cups. So it just kind of depends. One of the things that we do at Riverside, because we like both of our cups for something else when we do an intervention. So we actually will use and this is just a little trick that I'm showing you, but we'll actually use this to hold our lidocaine. Okay. So it, there's no set rule that it has to be this cup, mm -hmm. but for our purposes, we're just gonna practice with this cup for now, okay? Um, but that's a good question. Now, if say, so if, if I did only have the one cup and I had my lidocaine in there and you, they didn't want you putting it in here, then yeah, you'd have to either get another little cup or um, you'd have to get maybe empty this bowl, let them pour the medicine in the bowl, and then draw it all up into syringes that you labeled. Okay. So there's different ways that that situation can be handled. All right, for our purposes, again, this can be different per doctor, per lab, per scrub tech. But what I'm gonna have you do is use a large syringe for, and I'm just gonna kind of, so I can get it back off to demonstrate two more times. I'm gonna have three 10 cc syringes of my flesh. Two's gonna be for the doctor, one's gonna be for me. I'm gonna have, because we're going for morals. So this is another thing. This can differ depending on what access site we are using. So for femoral, most physicians are gonna use two 10 cc syringes or 12. Some labs have 12 cc instead of 10 cc's. Why, I don't know, that's just what they ordered. And so for femoral access, you're gonna to have to use a lot more lidocaine to numb up the area than you are for your radial access. This is, as I already mentioned, very superficial, like with the short needle, okay? So some doctors actually will have, will want you to put flush in a three cc syringe if it's radial. And you'll just put the short needle, have that ready, and that'll be what they use to administer lidocaine for the radial. But if we're doing femoral, and that's what I'm gonna have you guys set up for is femoral, we're gonna do the two 10 cc's full of lidocaine, okay? So I don't have anything yet, I'm just gonna wait. Now, there's other labels like verapamil, adenosine, nitroglycerin, or my waste bowl. I'm gonna label my waste bowl. And then I'm also gonna go ahead, I like to put a few four by fours in there. Your waste bowl is going to be for, say you get blood in a syringe, the doctor draws back from the patient, there's blood in the syringe, and so I still want to use this syringe. You'll come back here with your blood and you'll put it in your waste bowl. That blood hits the plastic, you know, depending on how hard you push it in, it can kind of splatter. So I just usually put some 4x4s in to kind of help that does, so it doesn't splatter. 
okay? Um, we're going to get into more detail about these other medications when we would actually have them on the tray. Remember, we've already talked about nitroglycerin. So you could have a place where they just go ahead and put some nitroglycerin on their every tray. Also methylpropylol. Hmm? And some metoprolol, right? No. No, not for this one? No, we're never going to put metoprolol on the tray. Oh, they so. may administer it if mm -hmm. they needed to for blood pressure, but we're not mm -hmm. going to put it on the tray. Um, your main medications would be your verapamil, your adenosine, or your nitroglycerin, okay. and your lidocaine. For the metoprolol, it would be on your crash cart then? Yes. Yeah, remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember. Mm -hmm. okay. Crash cart. Yes, possibly. Okay. Um, or in the Pixis if they needed it. And that's just the, the uh, box, the locked type computerized drug box, so to speak, okay. that they put the patient's name in to pull out medications on for that, those specific patients. Okay, um, so we'll go into more detail about that later. So now I'm just gonna kind of put those to the side. All right. I'm not going to use my threes. I'm only going to use one of these. Yeah, I'm not going to use that. So you just see, depending on what you're going to use, um, how you're going to use it, this is kind of where I would say I would start. Now, as I said, so we're going to be taking items off of here, putting them onto the patient. Um, and so once the drape is off, my two this will be gone I still would want to kind of keep my labels dry so again this did I say wet side and dry side yes. yeah okay just making sure so kind of again keep I would you'd be using some of these towels over here so this side may get a little more empty okay as we're moving on this again is kind of my workspace where I'm getting everything labeled and I'm working on flushing items as we're, we move on. So speaking of flush, really, once I've got this set up, and I drink my patient, I can't do anything else until I get my flush and my lidocaine, okay? And so in normal world, we wouldn't have waited this long, all right? But I didn't want to distract you, and I want you to see how she's doing it, and we got to talk about that. So um, go ahead and bring the flush. Yes, so um, I'll let Tia, she's gonna help me. Okay, so this is a decanter, a bag decanter. This is used to spike the flush, so you can pass it off. So it comes sterile with two caps on the end of it. So you would open it up and you would keep both ends sterile. And so when you use it to spike a bag, I'll take this one out. So I would pull it out. And just hold that little flying piece. I hate that bag. Um, I would take this end off, leave this end on. And show them that that, see, pull that back out. It's really sharp. Yeah. So that's oh, okay. the spiking part. These are, they sealed. come sealed. Oh, and it's okay. like a pla it's like a rubber that seals it. So oh, go okay. ahead. That's so then I would just hold right there and I would twist that on. And so. You have to break that seal. You have to also be very careful. Don't touch your, don't let that hit your hand. Don't let that hit the side it of the bag, anything, because that has to stay sterile. Your fluid inside is sterile and that has to stay sterile to be passed onto the tray. Remember our heparin ice flush. Let's talk about that real quick. So depending on the size of your bag. So remember heparin. So you might remember, how does heparin come in the bottle? So let me rephrase that question. So every CC has a certain amount of heparin. Mm -hmm. How much heparin is in every CC? It's units. So how many units of heparin is in every CC? Is it one ml? What you said? Is it one ml? Nope. Oh. A cc is an ml, mm -hmm. so every one cc or ml, how many units? Tia, do you remember? A thousand. Yeah. One thousand units of heparin in every cc or milliliter. 
So when we have our bags, where's the one that's already pre-done? Can you show them that one? So if we make it ourselves, remember if it's a 500 cc normal saline bag, we're gonna put 1,000 units of heparin, which is one cc. That's the pre-made bag. Pre mm -hmm. Those you don't add anything to. Okay, so you just spike it and pass it all. Yeah, and that is a liter bag, which is a thousand milliliters, is a liter. All right, and that has 2,000 units or two mLs of heparin in that bag. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the ones that we make ourselves, that's what I was saying. If it's a 500 mL bag, we put a thousand units or one cc. If it's a liter bag or a 1,000 milliliter bag, we're gonna put 2,000 units or two mLs in it, okay? All right, so now she's gonna demonstrate how to pass it off to the other one, just because those two spikes might be confusing. That, that's for another purpose. That's why they have, they, we've spiked both of those. And once you spike it, they're gonna yes. leak. So that's why we keep the spikes in them, the decanters in them. So when I go to pass it off, I would tell her what it is. So this is 500 milliliters of heparinized saline. Mm -hmm. and, and how much is the concentration? So that's the big thing. So tell me how much heparin is in it. So it would be 500 milliliters. Of, it's one unit? 1,000 units. Yeah. Uh, one milliliter. So this is how I say it to make it easy. Mm -hmm. So here's your, I'm passing heparinized saline. There's 1,000 units of heparin in this 500 cc bag. Big thing is concentration of heparin and how, what size bag it is. Okay. 1,000 units in this 500 milliliter bag. Yes. If it was the 1,000, I would say it's 2,000 units of heparin in a liter bag. And demonstrate. Then I would say expiration. I would say expiration is good. So then I would take the top off. See how she's staying a foot away. She's staying about a foot above and she's just letting it kind of gravity but she has also she can squeeze that bag to make it go a little bit faster. Since this is a 500 cc bag she's just going to give me the whole bag. If it was a 1000 we might do half of the bag or 600 and save the other because we're gonna need it for our manifold setup. If it's a 500 bag, they're probably just gonna use another 500 heparinized saline bag for the manifold setup. Again, that depends. She's been at Memorial. Memorial, they do 500 and 500. We pass off two and then we hang at 500. Okay. Riverside, we use the thousand, those pre-mixed actually, for the most part, and uh, we pass off six to 700 and save the rest to hang. So it just, it'll depend on the site, but that's how, and so you guys, when you're practicing, now you're not gonna have to do that for test purposes, but I'm gonna watch you guys when you're practicing because you still need to know this skill. I'll be watching and making sure you're doing it properly, okay? All right, let's go ahead and give me my lidocaine as well. Okay, so it would come with a cap on it like this. And even another little cap across that mm -hmm. rubber part. Show them the rubber part, kind of just tilt it. Well, tilt that oh. bottle. So that you could stick a needle in, wipe it with alcohol, stick a needle in, and just draw maybe 10 cc's out. Okay, but a lot of labs are gonna just pass off the whole bottle of it. And so they'll break that silver cap off and then she's gonna demonstrate. So I would take off this plastic piece, our rubber piece, and then I would come to her and I would show her that it's 2% or 1% Lido and I would say expiration is good. And then I will pour it. And see, I could be working. I could actually be starting to draw up my flush while she's actually doing that. And this is again, something that now when I'm testing you guys, I'm gonna be your circulator. So you're gonna be here where I am. You're gonna be getting everything set up and I'm gonna stand, I'm not a good circulator. A good circulator doesn't wait. They have everything ready. They come on up and they start doing this. 
but because I'm testing you, I want you to tell me where, what you want, where you want it, and then I will give it to you, just for test purposes. But in the real world, you shouldn't have to, to do that. Your circulator, if, and if you're, so if you're the circulator, you are doing and you're ready without having to be asked, okay? All right, so now, let's take a break. I didn't take a break last time. Let's take like a, just run to the bathroom, grab a drink, and then 